going to talk about some of the sculpture that Norman has created over the years. And this piece is exceptionally fascinating. Uh, every time I look at it, I see something different. It generates a lot of questions for the viewer. And, uh, but while we've got Norman here, we're going to see if he can answer some of those questions for us. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, this is just uh, it's all kind of stuff going on here. So first of all, what's the name of this one? And well, it's called Whimsy. Well, that's a, that's a good name. OK. And uh, it's not my original name. Mm. It was named by um, a lady who's a former student of mine who helped me with that, the other piece of sculpture in right. the lead pouring portion of it. And um, up until COVID, she had been coming to my home to print on my press a children's book that she's creating hmm. of the, uh, of the English, um, I'm trying to think of the English alphabet now. It, it's, it goes back historically. Right. Margaret, forgive me. <laughs> but anyway, Mar <laughs> Margaret uh, Alstrom is her name. And uh, she helped me with the first lead pouring. And uh, that's this part, the silver part. Yes. Okay. The, and so in a, in a sense, this is a collaboration, but her first reaction to it when I sent her photographs was that uh, she thought it was whimsical. And it is whimsical, but it, it does involve more, more people than just Margaret. The, the, the lady who uh, helped me with the title on the quagmire mm -hmm. and the quiet, her name is Megan Holland. And some of the hickory nuts here that have been polychromed uh, were painted by her huh. uh, during a coffee drinking session when, when we were at a stage where we couldn't really do, when we had to do social distancing. And I haven't <clears throat> been able to even do anything in my home. But so she, you were having coffee and painting? In my kitchen. Painting acorn, walnuts, yeah. acorns. These elements walnuts. come from a linden tree in on, on my friend Pete uh, Bowman's home, he has a studio on Lummy Island, which is outside of Seattle. Mm -hmm. you, you can only get there by ferry boat driving through an Indian reservation wow. to get to the island. But he has this massive linden tree in his backyard. And uh, when I visited him, he boxed me up some of the branches on the, that were on the ground underneath the linden tree because I was so fascinated with them. Right. And I brought them back to the studio. So these curved elements that are green and they look like they're split and they are split mm -hmm. with a jigsaw. I cut them with a jigsaw. Uh, those elements come all the way from Lummi Island. Um, what about the centerpiece that's uh, hollowed that, that, out? That's, off of my, that's the bark off of a dead tree on my property and I, uh, I gather, I'm, I'm a hickory, t hickory nut hoarder <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I collect a lot of hickory nuts and oh, I, ha okay. I, have, I have a repository of those. So and you and the squirrels are battling for the hickory nuts? No, I just love it after they get through with them. Oh, okay. And you know, once they're done with them, they, they've done some nice sculpting of which they're probably not that aware of because I think they're just looking for the meat. Well, I guess even squirrels can be artists in some yeah. way. So, uh, and anyway, so Margaret is involved here. Pete is involved uh, in, I would say, just in distance. And interesting thing about all these people is they're good catalyzers. They, they catalyze my thinking. In the case of the assemblages back here in the corner when I was having some technical difficulties with the water-soluble ink and my registration wasn't going right, and I'm a real stickler about that. Hmm. He would look at it and he said, well, if it's not working, just either throw them away or take advantage of them and try to do something else with them. Right. And, and he was absolutely correct. I mean, he, he, he's the kind of person who can work on a, a painting on a wood panel for a couple of years and still not be satisfied with Ooh. it. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's not getting el anything else done because right. he, he's a good guitar player and he, he wow. loves music and all that. But he's, um, he, he 
impressed upon me the idea that you, even through your failures, you can come through and come up with some interesting things. And of course, the lead pouring is a little bit uh, chancy. It's not as chancy as like when, I forget the artist that Kenneth Tyler had in collaboration, they had him in a room and they were melting uh, hot, I guess it was hot aluminum, and they just took the crucible and just threw it against the wall. And they were creating these works of art with, with hot aluminum in wow. the studio. So this, this is not that, I don't want to use the experimental, it's just not that chance taking. It, right. I, I usually try to get some kind of containment of the overall form. And yeah. you can use all kinds of words for that, closure, uh, Stravinsky used that term uh, form. He said that through all of the, it, it, he's, he's such a knowledgeable composer um, and knew all of the tools, but he would say that the composer is in the least bit aware of what, what things are happening in the middle of the highest creative moments. That's paraphrasing, that's not really quoting. Right. The quote's over there on the wall. <laughs> but um, he said the form is everything. So right. in other words, when you're finished with a piece of music, it's done. Then, you, then it gets played or it gets sung. The, when the poet finishes the poem, it's finished. I mean, when the reporter sends the story in, that's it for the moment because reporters are constantly reporting. You right. know? And when you write the novel, it's done until you write your next novel. Now, in the case of Franz Schubert, he had what, an unfinished symphony? So, I've got some unfinished of, books, if that counts. <laughs> it counts. Yes. Yeah. Megan supposedly is writing something, and I questioned her about it, and she said, Well, I don't have to finish it right now. Why is that important? Right. So she you know, lays it on the line. It's her decision, not mine. Right. I can question it. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their own calendar, that's for sure. Uh, so when you're planning this, do you have the pieces, you already know where they need to go, but then once you pour the... The lead, the, the lead is a later lead. stage. But it comes, but it's there, and then you put the pieces into it while it's still... No, before it, no, no. I poured well, the lead around the pieces. So the pieces were already there, and the lead poured yeah, around them. Yeah, and underneath the lead is, is copper. Gotcha. Copper has to be prepped so that when you pour the lead, it'll stick. Right, Just kind like of like when, doing stained glass. Yeah, when you're soldering two pieces of wire together, right. you need to put, uh, what is that called? Like a uh, uh, yes. soldering paste or yeah. something like that. And that way, uh, the two metals will join. Okay, so that's what keeps it all in place then. Well, yeah, sometimes it falls apart. You know, like in the, in the assemblages, when we were assembling this show, one of the little pieces of lead fell out and we took it apart to repair it. And then uh, when my, one of my students came to see the exhibition, we got to talking about Marcel Duchamp and he said, well, you know what? Just why don't you just leave it? Right. Why did you want to change it? It's not going to make that big of an impact, uh, even though you know about it. Mm -hmm. But nobody else will. Yeah. They'll yeah. walk up and go, yeah, that's finished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um, again, with the burnt, the burnt wood here is different than the burnt wood in the other piece because I, 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 did, I damaged this piece in the process and I didn't like what it was looking like, so I decided to mix up and try to match the color of the burnt wood using a burnt umber mixture with black acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I painted each one of these and if you were to look very closely at these elements compared to those, they look very different. When you, when you burn a piece of wood and brush it with right. a wire brush, it has a, a, a warm subtlety to it, and it's a lot different looking than this. But I don't think it makes that big of a difference right. in the overall appearance of the piece. So did you uh, have the, uh, the walnuts in mind? You know, I mean, you're like, okay, I'm going to use these one day to make... Uh... Yeah, what I did here was, uh, I'm trying to remember, it's hard for me to tell right now on the inside. I don't know whether I, I think I left the inside of this natural. 
Right. And I, I wanted it to be very dark inside, so I just started weaving these things in with the wire. And I essentially tied them together uh, and connected them to the, the shroud or the chamber and worked my way down all the way to the bottom. Right. But that was not, that was not, just like in a lot of the things I do, that was not a forethought right. way ahead of time. It was spontaneous. It just I, kinda I, I sit there and I look at stuff and then I say, okay, what do you want to do? And then mm -hmm. I just start doing it. Right. Is that an okay to do, way to do it? I think so. <laughs> it seems to work out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the way a lot of people need to be a little more spontaneous. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what's interesting is the pieces are stationary, but when you put the, uh, the lead in there, it makes it flow. It almost feels like it's, it's moving now, within there. An another thing about the lead is, again, I think about this, and I'll probably do something about it as time goes by, but I, I have lead because I have a lot of old type metal that was given to me, yeah. and it's not usable type metal. Type metal consists, if it's real type metal, it consists of lead, tin, copper, and antimony. Antimony is the only metal that won't shrink hmm. once, once the, the metal cools off. Right. The reason for that is because the antimony allows them to cast very intricate details for type. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do that. But the question in my mind is, um, why don't I use pewter? I don't even know what the constituent elements in pewter are. And I'm, right. I'm thinking, is pewter like safer than something. lead? Because yeah. I don't want to go around licking the lead. Yeah, no kidding. But I've this had, is definitely a hands-off sculpture. But I've had to polymer. This lead has polymer on it. Okay. So it's protected. But then when you use polymer, depending on whether you use matte or glossy, if, the, if it's matte, it'll take the shininess out of the metal right. a little bit. If it's glossy, it'll do the opposite. So yeah. I, th those are little technical things that have, have some, they play some role in the overall aesthetic. So you were talking about your friend and how she's kind of taking her time on doing her novel and the other fellow that you said took yeah. him years to do stuff. Uh, just so people know, how long does something like this take you? Do you work on it till it's done or do you, do this and then that thing and come back to it and uh, the ladder the ladder yeah so you kind of got several well, things going on at the, the same the, time the invite for this exhibition precipitated a uh, sharp focus on getting this okay. one done because i wanted it to be in the show right well it's fascinating i mean you could just and it's in the window so in its space so you can walk around it and see it from all sides and and continue to just kind of Marvel at what's in there. Yeah, and I, I'm true to form here because I've lost a lot of really good work that I've done over the years because of not having adequate storage. Mm -hmm. There's one piece I'm working on that's it's a version of one of my drawings called Agitato Death, which is based on a, a, a dead woodpecker that I found that had crashed into a window, and I went and did a drawing of it, and then I... Uh, a mixed media drawing involving pencil and watercolor. And then I made a reduction linoleum box print of it. And then I made um, a piece of assemblage sculpture where I, it's got a beautiful, beautiful wood base uh, and a, a center section that had, was made of a, a found rusty steel container. I don't even know what the container was. Hmm. And then I had wires coming out of that and attached to the wires were blue jay feathers. And when, when that was at its best point, it was a really beautiful looking piece of work. I took slides with me to Arizona and the audience that saw it made, one of the commentators said, you know, if you were to make a piece of sculpture like this in Arizona, you'd be in violation of the... the, the oh, the bird protection laws or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And I said, even if I found these bird feathers on my property? And they said, yep. Wow. So all those feathers are gone now. Yeah. The, the, the work has changed. It's degraded somewhat. I still have it. But I, the lady who did these taught me how to make feathers. Huh. I know how to make feathers now out of yarn and out of there marbled paper. Well, that's and totally legal, I think. Yeah, so what I'm going to do, 
again, it's what do you do next, Norman? What's right. your next thing? I'm going to make uh, little marble feathers until I accumulate enough of them. I'm going to reconstitute that oh, piece, wow. of, piece of sculpture and bring oh, it I back to wait. life. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Well, you better get to work. You got a lot to do. I did want to ask you just a general art question about uh, just people and their own creativity. You know, I've, I've, you know, you bring people up to the art center or you talk to them and whatever, whether I do or you do, and, and there's always somebody that says, oh, I'm not creative. I could never do that. How do you answer somebody that says that? Well, find a kid in your family, whether it's your own child, a nephew, someone else's kid, and hopefully they're already making marks or doing something creatively and identify that. Now, when I had my conversation with Holly the other day, she posted some drawings that her grandchildren had done and she said she was going to keep a file on them and the drawings were incredible. Mm -hmm. They were incredible. So I say go to, the, go to the place where it's fresh and raw and new and unpoisoned. And when I say unpoisoned, I mean, you know, people, people do have a tendency to minimize real creativity. When they see it, they, maybe they don't, how, don't know how to identify it, or maybe in some cases it could be scary. Right. And if it's on a piece of paper or something like this, it can't be scary. It's not, it's right. not going to kill you to look at it. It's yeah. not going to kill you to look at uh, Picasso's, uh, when, he, when he's talking about erotic art from Japan, or if Dubuffet is portraying eroticism in his work, that won't kill you. You're just going to look at it. Right. It's not going to kill you to read anything out of the Bible either. Right. If you, if you look at, if you read that book, Shape of Content by Ben Sean, he tells you. I mean, he, he, he did this lecture years ago. He tells you to read anything you can get your hands on. Right. You know, and don't be so discriminating if you're an artist. Just consume the information and it'll feed, feed what you're doing. That's good. So for the person, so I can understand the, the adult going and seeing the child that's doing art. How do you speak to somebody who's in their 40s and they haven't ever tried art? How can, you know, what can it's we... It's never too late. Right. Try something. Yep. And, and, you know, don't have somebody else guide you. Someone else can actually give you some instruction, but getting instruction on how to be creative is a difficult thing. Right. That involves criticism. It's and kind of like telling somebody to be spontaneous. It also involves being vulnerable. You have to be a vulnerable. When I taught, we did critiques, and I, if we did a one-on-one, -on -one, like if I were with you, I'd, I'd say, okay, look, Today's the day we're going to talk, really sink, in, sink our teeth into your work. But I warn you, it, it's going to make both of us vulnerable to talk about it. But you just have to trust me. Right. That's good. Good things. Good things. Well, I am so thrilled that I got to sit here with you and talk about all of your amazing work. And there's even more here that we just couldn't cover in this short period of time. And so uh, I encourage everybody to come up to the Art Center and see this and to find Norman online and see all the th wonderful things that he's done. And uh, like he said, uh, if you don't think you're creative, you really are. So get out there and try, uh, try things until you find the one that just works for you. So I want to thank everybody for, for watching. I want to thank the city of Alpharetta. I want to thank the mayor and the cultural arts uh, group and Arts Alpharetta and this wonderful art center and everybody that's associated with it. This has been uh, an amazing interview. I can't thank you enough for allowing us into your, into your thoughts. And so uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much and we'll see you at the art center.